Steven Spielberg's classic science fiction film Minority Report predicts a future in which technology has pervaded every nook and cranny of society. We see a scene in which the protagonist, played by Tom Cruise, walks through a shopping mall. Everywhere he turns, devices using eye and face recognition technologies address personalized ads to him, bidding him to buy a car, to drink Guinness, to use American Express. A digital display greets him by name as he enters the Gap clothing store and asks him if he liked his last purchase. Now this is a rather nightmarish shopping scene that is meant to make us feel oppressed and anxious. But what if we could use such technology for a more elevated purpose than selling us various products? What if the technology were drawing our attention not to perfume and vacation packages, but to science and scholarship? What would we think of this scene if it weren't in a shopping mall, but on a university campus, with students walking around and being encouraged to consider a line of T.S. Eliot's poetry, to ponder a scientific equation, or to pause for a moment over a detail from an 11th century Chinese painting. Students would receive a constant stream of high-grade intellectual content, and all that time they now spend hanging out around the student center, walking to classes, riding the bus, and so on, could be devoted to the pursuit of learning. A perfect arrangement, right? To my sensibility, as I hope to yours, no. We feel something terribly wrong with this picture, which seems at least as bad as the shopping mall scene in Minority Report. But why? Wouldn't such a futuristic university be achieving our educational goals of training our students' attention on learning and transmitting to them the treasures of knowledge? There are two predominant things wrong with this high-tech university I've asked us to imagine. Let's say that it may be a powerful solution to a misconceived problem. It assumes that the problem to be solved is that students have insufficient information and knowledge. So we need to get more and more varied information in front of them at all times, in all places, and in all the modes of delivery we can muster. But what if the problem weren't at all the quantity of information we are providing, but rather the quality of our students' experience of it? We often distinguish mere information from genuine understanding, and we recognize an important difference between a knowledge of facts, knowing something, from an ability to bring facts together meaningfully and apply them in new contexts of making and doing, knowing how. Being bombarded with more and more information, even if this information would seem to be more intellectually edifying than the specs of a new line of automobile, may not serve to enhance the quality of our experience, our understanding, or our ability to apply knowledge meaningfully to our individual and social lives. In fact, we have reasons to suspect that this very abundance of information and the related lack of attention to the quality of intellectual experience may hamper the development of more profound, longer-term capacities to understand. This brings us face to face with the second flaw in our futuristic university. It would treat our students as mere consumers of information, to be shaped by an ever more perfect marketing of the intellectual goods the university has to offer. And perhaps even more damning, it would make the lifelong student-consumer restlessly hungering after intellectual clickbait a perverse byproduct of a system gone very, very wrong. I have lingered upon this dystopian image of our educational future, however, not only as a cautionary note. It also, as its flip side, reveals the positive potentials that can be unlocked when we attend more carefully to what leads to genuine understanding and a qualitatively rich experience of learning. Our students, we insist, must become active agents in their own education. Their dispositions, values, and experiences are the powerful lenses through which they focus on, and also importantly filter out, 
elements from the vast flow of information they encounter to discover within it meaningful connections and future potentials. One such disposition or intellectual virtue is that of curiosity, and it stands in stark contrast to the modes of fleeting attention ready for capture by the ruses of advertisement and the stupefications of spectacle. Curiosity has historically gotten a bad rap. It is sometimes suggested idle dabbling or the putting of one's nose where it doesn't belong, usually with ill-fated results. Curious women were especially warned to keep their inclinations under control. Pandora let the demons out of the box because she couldn't resist her curiosity about what was inside. Eve was curious to know what the fruit of knowledge would bring her. Bluebeard's young wife couldn't resist unlocking the door he warned her not to open. And that poor old cat, we know from the folk maxim, was done in by its curiosity. Still, even in these traditional suspicions of curiosity, we can discern its virtuous features as well. It pursues investigation and seeing for oneself in the face of the because I told you so of authority. It goes beyond the limited bounds of the already known to try to know more or more deeply. It motivates the curious learner to overcome fear and even real danger to become a courageous pursuer of truth no matter where it leads. It transforms the curious from an inert, passive container of given facts to an active, evolving agent of understanding. In a world constrained by traditions and traditional authority, curiosity was indeed a dangerous trait. But in a world where no given tradition or authority can hold back the advance of knowledge, it becomes one of the most important virtues one can cultivate. Let us return to the image with which we began, and now we can openly admit what till now we have left unspoken. Whether we imagine the explicitly dystopian world of Minority Report, or my seemingly more benign vision of a futuristic high-tech university modeled after it, we confront terrifying societies of control in which we have already lost much of what we conceive of as our freedom. Curiosity, in stark contrast, implies a persistent inclination to exercise one's intellect freely, to think for oneself, to develop one's capacity to understand, to pursue one's inner life of thought autonomously rather than to have it programmed and restricted by others. It is an intellectual virtue on which so many other virtues, including important moral and social virtues, may depend. Indeed, our very future may depend on it, if we are only curious enough to begin finding out what our future might still be.